Well, hello again, everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon session uh, for the sixth annual meeting for the Soil Health Institute. I'm glad so many of you can join us back again. Uh, we have uh, two really interesting sessions this afternoon. Uh, the first one is on um, understanding uh, and managing the soil microbiome. Uh, and you know that uh, our state of knowledge in that is changing pretty much on a daily basis, if not many times a day. Uh, and so uh, who's gonna help lead us through that uh, session is uh, Dr. Arnab Bomek. Uh, I'll introduce him in just a second here, but I also just want to express my, my personal appreciation to Ashley Shade and, and Liz Rickey also for joining us. Uh, so we're, we're expecting, and I know we're gonna, not be disappointed uh, at a really cool session here. Um, so Dr. Arnab uh, Bomek uh, is an assistant professor of soil science and microbiology at North Carolina A&T State University, where he studies things like the mechanisms that govern soil organic matter dynamics and biological networks that provide a lot of these different ecosystem services uh, in sustainable agricultural systems. So Arnab, uh, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you for your opening comments. Thank you, Wayne. I'll just quickly share my screen. Can you see it? Awesome. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'll be moderating the session on understanding and managing soil microbiomes. So uh, I have a couple of slides, uh, but I would like to give an introduction first. You know, so we, we all know that soils are home to, to countless and diverse microorganisms, right? And uh, they provide a wide range of services, including nutrient cycling, uh, nutrient storage, uh, stress tolerance, and, and much more. Now, these have a huge impact on uh, the productivity and environmental quality. Uh, therefore, you know, understanding how the soil microbiome works and how soil management influences them is a very powerful tool to develop and uh, optimize soil health management practices. So the, the topic of today's presentation is going to be optimizing soil health benefits by understanding soil microbial processes. So one, one of the major ways uh, to, to enhance soil health would be to build soil carbon. And if you think fundamentally, there are two different ways how you can do it. You can add carbon to the soil. And second, you can reduce or prevent loss of carbon from the soil. And a range of soil health management practices like uh, reduced tillage, you know, application of compost, manure, uh, cover crop incorporation, uh, crop rotations, all these are actually intended to, to build soil carbon. And at the same time, it increases soil biodiversity and uh, increases soil microbial activity. But we should also be aware that there are certain challenges or opportunities you know, uh, associated with these soil health management practices. And I'm going to talk about you know, uh, a couple of them today. So the first uh, kind of challenge uh, is synchronizing the nutrient release uh, with the plant uptake. So most of all, all the sources of nutrients uh, are organic in this case. So the release has to depend on microbial transformations, which is really complex. So that leads to um, sometimes difficulty in synchronizing and leading to losses. And uh, you know, today I'll, I'll be mainly focusing on uh, one of the aspects, which is nit nitrous oxide emissions, which could uh, potentially offset the carbon storage benefits uh, from, from a soil health management system. So it's clear to us, uh, right, that soils play a very important role in uh, mitigating greenhouse gases. And uh, depending on, you know, how we manage the soil, uh, it could either act as a sink or a source of greenhouse gases. Now, if we look into uh, the data, agricultural soil management uh, contributes to around 75% of uh, total nitrous oxide emissions. I mean, that's huge, right? And nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, just like carbon dioxide. The difference is it's 300 times more potent, and we all know that. But what it actually means is if you are capturing 300 units of carbon dioxide, and at the same time you're releasing one unit of nitrous oxide, you're basically 
um, uh, offsetting the benefits, right, of that carbon capture or car carbon drawdown. Uh, so therefore, and also we need to remember, you know, recapturing one unit of carbon dioxide is easier because we can do it through plants, but recapturing that lost unit of nitrous oxide is, is tricky and difficult. So we need to consider carbon dioxide equivalent, which takes into consideration not only, you know, carbon dioxide, but also other greenhouse gases uh, that agriculture produces like, you know, uh, nitrous oxide and methane, and that would help us optimize the, the soil health benefits. So talking about agricultural soils, uh, there are two basic microbial processes uh, which lead to nitrous oxide emission. The first one is nitrification. Uh, broadly, nitrification is the conversion of ammonium to nitrate uh, by group of microbes called nitrifiers. And they operate when there is enough oxygen in the soil. Now nitrous oxide, where, which you see over here, is a byproduct of the nitrification process. Now, it's not a huge, big source. So nitrification is not a huge source of nitrous oxide, but 1% of the ammonium that gets converted to nitrate could actually be lost as nitrous oxide. But the major source of nitrous oxide from agricultural soils is denitrification. Again, it's a microbial process uh, which converts nitrate to nit dinitrogen gas, which, which is inert. But this happens through a series of steps, which involves different types of denitrifiers, which operate when uh, the amount of oxygen in the soil is limited. Now, depending on the right type of denitrifiers and the right balance of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the final product of denitrification could be nitrous oxide, which is in here you see like as an intermediate product rather than nitrogen gas. So that's, that is the, the, uh, the thing we are looking at. And uh, coming back to soil health management, uh, cover crops, manure, reduced tillage, these management practices, if not managed properly, could lead or modify soil conditions like modifying the soil oxygen content or modifying the amount of available soil carbon and nitrogen in a way that could uh, lead to higher nitrous oxide emission and incomplete denitrification, like you can see here. And uh, there have been recent studies where, which have found that avoiding the above ground cover crop incorporation causes or caused uh, nitrous oxide reduction. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So we, we reported um, a couple of studies in 2016 and 2017. Actually, this is from my PhD work. And uh, this was an incubation experiment where we added um, N15 labeled uh, cover crop residues to the soil. And what we found out was uh, around 4.5% of the nitrate present in the tissues got directly lost to nitrous oxide. So you see there's a short circuit in the nit uh, nitrogen cycle over there. And this happened under uh, conditions, uh, you know, soil temperatures below 10 degrees centigrade, which is approximately 50 degree Fahrenheit, uh, which would relate to, you know, let's say late fall, early spring conditions, depending on where you are in the United States. Um, and recently, we, we also published a study, a field study, uh, where we had different manure and cover crop residue um, exclusion treatments. So if you look into the graph on the right, uh, on the x-axis, uh, the M stands for manure incorporation, and CC stands for leguminous uh, above ground biomass of the cover crop incorporated. So plus would mean we actually incorporated it, and minus would mean that we did not add or incorporate it. And what we found out was uh, the cumulative nitrous oxide emissions during the entire growing season uh, was 60% higher in the treatments where uh, both manure and cover crop residues were incorporated as compared to the treatments where no cover crop, above ground cover crop residues were incorporated. So, I mean, there are different ways uh, to, to actually manage that balance, right? Uh, so there could be ways like regulating the rates of how much cover crop residues you are actually going to, to add, or there could be uh, uh, differences in the timing when you're actually adding the manure or 
you know, incorporating the cover crops. Or there could also be, uh, you know, ways by which you can manage the, the mix of the cover crops, you know, how much grasses, how much legumes you have in there. Uh, so one of the angles that currently, you know, our, our lab is looking at, you know, one of my uh, students is working on this is uh, to specially seclude the, the cover crop residues and the manure. And this uh, set of treatments where, you know, we are either broadcasting or incorporating the cover crop residues and the manure and looking into the effects um, on nitrous oxide and basically the microorganisms responsible for, for pr producing nitrous oxide. And hopefully, you know, we'll have some insights uh, how to minimize nitrous oxide emissions and at the same time uh, build soil carbon uh, with minimal trade-offs. So I'll stop there and let's see what's the time. Okay, I think I'm right on time. So I'll stop sharing the slides and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Shade. Uh, Dr. Ashley, Ashley Shade is an assistant professor of microbiology and molecular genetics at Michigan State, where she studies the resilience of microbiomes. So uh, great to have you. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Awesome, thanks. All right, how's the slide look? Look great. good? Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. I'm excited to be here and um, excited to kind of share with you today an overview of some of the work that my lab is thinking about in terms of microbiome resilience. And so I also wanted to share that I, um, I grew up in a farming community in central Pennsylvania, fell in love with biology and just pursued that passion the whole way to becoming a research scientist. And so you know, I grew up playing in the corn fields of those corn soy rotations that many of you are quite familiar with in this uh, institute meeting. So um, I wanted to start out kind of basic, um, which is what, what do we mean when we say microbiome? It's a word that we've all heard, it's thrown around all the time. And so, um, and a lot of people have this um, misconception that a microbiome can only be part of a human gut or like part of a, a host, but actually, a microbiome is simply a community of microbial populations and they live together and they interact with each other or with their local environment or with both. Um, and so as a researcher studying the microbiome, the emphasis is really on understanding the genes that those microorganisms have, what functions they provide and the molecules of this whole community as an interacting system. We also want to understand the feedbacks of a microbiome community to its ecosystem or host. And so a soil has a microbiome, a plant has a microbiome, your gut has a microbiome for sure. Um, there is, I don't think, very many surfaces, inhabitable surfaces on this planet that lack a microbiome. Um, and the other part of my research program is all about resilience. And so I mean resilience in the ecological sense. And this is the capacity of a system to recover after it's been altered by a disturbance. And a disturbance is a discrete change in the environment that is expected to have some kind of biological impact. Um, and so when we think about resilience in the microbiome, we're often thinking about those different members in the microbiome community and um, their composition, their contributions to the community, but we're also thinking about their functions and what those microbes are providing for the system they're living in and whether or not the taxa and also their functions are recovering after a disturbance or an alteration to their environment. And so why, why should we give a hot dog about microbiome resilience? Who cares? Um, so it's really important um, because as um, Arnab just said, uh, these microbes are providing really important functions in their systems and to their hosts. And here, what I'm showing you on this slide is a picture from a paper that was published in 2019 in a really good journal by a consortium of microbiome scientists that tended to work in environmental systems like oceans and terrestrial systems and agricultural systems. And so this is just showing a few of the ways that microbial process these feedback into Earth's climate change feedback systems. And so um, just a few of, of very many. And so to understand how the microbiome and the functions that it provides for its system, 
are going to respond to these ongoing stressors associated with global climate change is becoming even more urgent and important. And so what we want to do in my lab essentially is to be able to predict and manage microbiomes towards these stable functions in the face of these ongoing and amplifying consequences of environmental change. And we wanna do that to the end goal of supporting healthy crops and ecosystems. So my lab does quite a bit of work in this area, but today I'm going to focus just on, um, on the middle one where we're talking about microbiome controls in agro ecosystems. And um, here are some things we do know about microbiomes in soil and cropping systems. Um, first, we know that these microbiomes are super diverse. Um, and by diverse, I mean they have many, many different microbial species or taxa in them. Soils, in fact, are the most diverse microbiomes known. They are the, the king of the king, the king cheese, um, as far as microbiome diversity goes. Um, what we also know is that these microbiomes provide really essential um, functions, not only for the soil environment, but also for the plant and crop associated hosts there. Um, another thing that we know is that these microbial communities are quite dynamic, meaning that they're responsive and sensitive to changes in their environment, including routine changes like changes in the season, changes in management practices in your field. They're going to change in their composition and that can often relay to a change in functionality. Um, we also know that location matters. And so your soil and my soil might have different microbiome members in it. They might provide some of the same functions, um, but maybe not exactly at the same rates, just depending on the function. And so location and context of that soil environment really matters. Um, we know that management practices matter for the microbiome. Um, we know that plant genotype can matter, but usually not as much as the the local soil environment. Um, and we also know that plants and cropping systems and their soils share microbes and that one can serve as a source for the other and vice versa. And so these microbial taxa have the capability to kind of disperse between these, these, um, these systems that are connected to each other, especially by spatial contact. So the big question here is how can we leverage the resilience of the microbiome to support soil and crop resilience? And so the way that we have to approach this is to first um, build some very foundational knowledge about the soil and plant microbiome. Um, this includes the dynamics of those systems, the distributions of the membership and who's even there. And I know this sounds very basic, but this is the information that we need to move forward because as I mentioned, soil microbiomes are the most diverse that we know, and we don't know who most of those members are. We can't even fathom what their genomes contain. Um, and as far as what their functionality is in the environment, for many of them, we simply do not know. Um, and so we need to get a good handle on what we're looking at before we can start to manage and manipulate it. And I also wanna say, um, while I'm showing you this slide, is that we aim to apply this systems-based knowledge to predict an understanding of ecological resilience for healthy soils and healthy crops, but we're not there yet. Like magical microbes do not exist. There is not a solution that we have right now where we can just come up with a bunch of different microbes, sprinkle them onto an agricultural field and have the outcomes that we, that we want. Um, and so this is a very active area of research and very promising and very exciting to be in right now, but no, no magic bullet, so to speak yet. Um, so resilience, how are we going to promote resilience in the microbiome? And the way that we think about this as ecologists is to try to promote what's called population rescue. And so population rescue is simply when we try to recover microbiome members that are sensitive to that disturbance, to that change in the environment. And you can recover them in a lot of different ways. And so I'm gonna spend the rest of my time kind of talking about the different methods that we can use to recover microbiome members from these different sources. If I can bring your attention to the bottom of the slide here, here's basically a timeline of what, what might happen to a microbiome in a soil. Um, during and after disturbance. So the disturbance, maybe this is a drought period, maybe this is a heat period, maybe this is a flooding period. Whatever your disturbance is, it's gonna change the environment. There are gonna be some local microbial populations that are sensitive to that disturbance. Those sensitive populations are gonna decline. They may die entirely, go extinct locally, or they may just um, deactivate, um, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but they may have some of their population that dies and some of them that manages to survive. 
Um, and so to support resilience of the system, of the community as a system that's functioning as a, as a community, as an interacting pieces, um, we need to re-enter those populations that we lost, or at least re-enter those functions that we lost in those sensitive populations. And so how do we do that? How do we rescue? Here are some ways that we can promote the rescue of obtaining or retaining beneficial microbes for resilient soil crop functions. Um, we can add, we can bait, we can wake, or we can pack. Um, so here, here's what I'm gonna talk about. So by adding, I mean, we can give the plants, the soil, the cropping system, biological treatments. Um, by baiting, we can recruit the microbes we need from the environment that exists there already. Um, we can wake up, meaning we can use plant or environmental signals to resuscitate or reactivate microbes that exist in the soil but are not active. Or we can pack, which is ways that we can potentially pass microbes from the seed to the offspring of the new crop. Um, and my lab does, a, we dabble in a little bit of each of these, I guess is um, how I would say it. And so, um, but I just wanted to over, uh, give an overview of the general um, approaches that we can think about. These aren't mutually exclusive of each other either. And there are, there are other protocols. And again, this is just one tool in a big management toolbox of selective breeding, um, field management, et cetera, to try to promote healthy soil and cropping systems. So let's start with the add. We can add biological treatments or AKA plant probiotics. There are a lot of products out there. Um, you've probably heard of this. This is probably the most familiar one. Um, a pro of this approach is that it's a readily translatable execution similar to how you might irrigate fields or apply fertilizer. Um, biologicals can be added to, to fields. Um, there are cons in this and that um, many of these may not be tested scientifically and so you don't always know if they're working. And the key issues there are with persistence of what you're adding, meaning is it going to stick? Is it going to stick around in your field long enough to see that functionality that you want? And second is activation. And so if you're applying a biological that is dormant or inactive, or even if you're adding it in an active state, is it going to stay active? Meaning it's going to continue growing, dividing, living, and providing the functionality of interest. Um, some approaches to, to this uh, strategy are to construct um, synthetic communities or isolate, um, that's isolates of microbes that are known to support plant and crop um, functions. And so you, you would produce these in, in consortia or an individual and add them back to the plant. Um, the photo I'm showing you here is a bunch of sorghum isolates we've got in our lab in a synthetic community that we're interrogating their functions right now and, and doing these tests to add them to so so soil and sorghum to see how they pr um, promote the plant health. Um, we're particularly interested in drought in that scenario. Okay, the second way is baiting. Um, and so this is plant or environmental recruitment of microbes from the local environment. So from the soil environment or from the, the local, um, the local um, area that you have there. Um, so as we mentioned, soil is the most diverse microbiome that we know. And so there's a lot of diverse potential for functionality right there in the field already. Um, but before we talk about baiting, we have to talk about who do we wanna bait to the plant? Because that is a big question mark for a lot of systems. Which microbes are important? We don't need all that diverse soil and microbiome um, for our crop or for our healthy soil. We just need the important ones. So we need to know which ones are important first. And one way we can do that is by applying concepts from what researchers are calling a core microbiome. Um, and I put this in air quotes because some, some people don't like this term, but it's essentially those microbiome members that are consistently associated with a system and expected to provide um, interactive benefit to that system. And so you can contrast that with what we might call an accessory microbiome. These are the microbiome members that are associated with a host in a particular condition. And they are also expected to provide benefit for that condition. So for this, you can think of like a drought scenario. Maybe there's some microbes that benefit a plant soil ecosystem during a drought that aren't really helpful when there's not a drought, but when there's a drought, um, maybe they're, they're able to be baited or recruited um, and, and helpful in that situation. So situ situationally helpful microbes. Um, there are also opportunist microbes. These aren't necessarily beneficial for a 
for a crop or for a healthy soil system, but they live in that environment, um, so, but they're not reciprocating for your crop. Um, and then you have all the transient members that are just passing through a system or are generally agnostic to the host environment. And so they're not really interacting. And so we wanna basically eliminate these last two here and just focus on um, these core microbiome members and accessory microbiome members in, in baiting um, because the rest of them aren't really helpful for the situation. So um, a pro of this approach is that it's going to rely on established plant microbe relationships. And it can, if you can tap into the accessory microbiome, it can be responsive to changing environmental conditions. Um, cons for this approach is that it's hard to distinguish beneficial microbes sometimes from those opportunistic ones. And you wanna make sure that the plant soil environment can recruit the right microbes at the right time if you're trying to focus in on that accessory microbiome. And that's, that's a real challenge. And so that's something that's being actively worked on in the research. Um, another thing is that we're like, well, why can't we just breed plants to better recruit the microbes that they need? Um, a lot of times we don't know which microbes they need explicitly. Um, so that's hard, but plant genotype influence is actually quite limited in environmental systems. So in greenhouses and control systems, we can see a large influence of um, plant genotype, but in the field, it always takes second, second fiddle to the soil context. And so that's just something to keep in mind about like application of that. Um, but we can do these core microbiome analysis. We can have some confidence in which ones are important and we can move forward with trying to help the plant and the soil recruit those. Um, we can also wake microbes. Um, this is uh, an, a, this is a piece of knowledge that not very many people know. Um, I'm showing you a figure here from a review paper was published and I wanna show you this green arrow bar here. This is percent inactive cells, microbial cells in the soil. And you see here, it's upwards of 80%. Um, so many of that microbial diversity harbored in the soil is inactive at any given point. Um, and so we can harness that diversity and that functionality if we might be able to reactivate from that dormant pool. Um, so this, again, relies on native microbiota to support the plants, their fit in their local environment, but we don't understand a lot of these signals. And so this is still under development. Finally, we can pack. We can pack microbiome members into seeds and um, try to get the plant and the, the soil system to, um, to grow those microbiome members. This is also something that plants already do, and we can add some stress conditions to try to make those microbiome members resilient to the stress. We can do this via seed or floral treatments. So um, just to sum up, we can add bait, wake, or pack microbiome members to support their local resilience. And I think that this is an area of great potential in um, microbiome science and plant management and agroecosystem management. And so there's still a lot of work to do, a lot of unknowns, um, but we have some good tools and some good strategies and we're making a lot of great progress. Um, I'd like to thank my lab and also again, thanks to the Soil Health Institute for the invitation to share today. Awesome presentation. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I think we might have time for one question. So uh, one of the questions were how would you define crop resilience and uh, how do you, what, how, how does soil microbiome actually help in crop resilience? Yeah, that's a good question. And so resilience is this capacity of the crop to recover from a stress. And so pick your favorite stress, maybe it's drought. Um, and so what we wanna do is help the crop get through the drought so that it's still yielding and still productive on the other side. And there are lots of ways that microbes can support different aspects of plant resilience. And of course it varies by, by the stress, right? So the microbes that are helpful for the plant during the stress, like some of these actinobacteria, which have these um, filamentous growth patterns that can help the plant to access water that's down deeper, that might not be the same microbe that you need for, for instance, a flooding situation or a situation there's, where there's contaminants or pollution in the soil. Um, and so you're gonna need different microbes for different stressors but there are many situations in which microbes provide functions that help the crop to withstand these various stressors in the environment. So it's situation specific. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shade. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Lise uh, Riki. She is a soil microbiome scientist at the Soil Health Institute, where she leads the assessment of microbial population dynamics 
using genomic tools to identify microbial soil health indicators. Hi, Liz. Hi, thank you, Arnab. Uh, let's see here. This is always the toughest part of a presentation, right? Getting your slides up. All right, can you see them? Yes, looks good. All right, well, hey, thanks again. And thank you everybody for attending today. So yeah, the title of my presentation is uh, Linking Soil Microbial Community Structure to Activity, a Continental Sale Assessment of Tillage Impacts. So over the past few decades, we know, or many of us know that there's been a lot of different biological indicators that have been incorporated in different soil health tests. And so three different categories that have been commonly used are one, looking at the size of the microbial community in, uh, in question, and then two, uh, a second way of thinking about it is these available resource pools for microbes to consume and continue their activity. And then the third being a broad scale measure of uh, microbial activity. So in this instance, uh, we're looking at respiration. And so while these different uh, tests, they're often uh, linked to changes in management, they're often difficult to interpret as far as linking to functional outcomes. And so when we think about functional outcomes, we're talking about things like increases in plant available nutrients or decreases in environmental losses through leaching in groundwater and things like that. So if we can under, better understand these microbes that are driving these different tests uh, that are commonly used already, we, we might be able to provide a better interpretation to the end user. So one test that's uh, commonly used in a, a bunch of different uh, suites of soil health tests is uh, potential carbon mineralization. And others might uh, recognize this as uh, soil respiration. And so what this is, it's a standardized assay where uh, you're taking a sample of soil, you dry it, you sieve it, and then you re-wet it. And so we're looking for this burst of activity upon that re-wetting. And so what we see is uh, this burst of activity is generally greater in reduced tillage systems. And in our current soil health test, it's currently interpreted as more is better. So that bigger burst means a healthier soil. But when we get down to it, what this measurement is really getting at, it's a few different, uh, few different ways the microbes are responding uh, to that sieving and drying. So the first being uh, is microbes, they consume the cells that, that couldn't make it through that drying period, that stress of that drying. Uh, and then secondly, there's consumption of these cytoplasmic substances that are released during that rewetting of that soil. So these microbes, they deal with uh, that change in osmotic pressure and through that they release these metabolites that then can be consumed by other microbes. And then finally, uh, other microbes are probably all of them, they're consuming these organic residues that are released from that sieving process. So organic materials that weren't previously available for consumption. So we know this um, measure, the standardized measure of carbon mineralization, it's moderately correlated with the abundance of microbes, but we also know that tillage is capable of altering that microbial community structure. And so what we've seen in the literature from individual site studies is, there's significant and insignificant differences in the microbial community uh, after tillage. And so some of this variation, it might potentially stem from differences in that sampling timing and processing, differences in the tillage implements themselves that are used in the studies, differences in the cropping system history, and then again, uh, differences in the soil inherent properties in the climates. So our goal was to try and link these changes in microbial community structure from tillage to these changes in these potential carbon mineralization measurements across North America. So to do that, we've got three objectives. Uh, the first being, uh, what, what is tillage doing to that community structure? Can we find patterns um, to see when things are changing or maybe figure out why things aren't changing? And then secondly, we want to identify these community members that are enriched under these no-till systems across these climates and soil types, seeing if we can find, you know, that set of organisms that's being enriched across all of these uh, different conditions. And then finally, we want to see if we can identify the organisms that are influential to these uh, standardized measurements of uh, microbial activity. So to do that, we're utilizing uh, data that was collected as part of the North American project to evaluate soil health measurements. 
So from the project, we uh, collected samples from 124 long-term research sites across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Uh, they're uh, depicted here on the right side of the, of, uh, the slide is uh, the little circles. So you can see quite a range of uh, locations. And so from these 124 sites, we collected just over uh, 2,000 samples or experimental units from these paired treatments from these different studies. So the samples were collected from uh, a depth of zero to 15 centimeters. And along with the soils, we also collected uh, five years of uh, management data from each of the different treatments. So for our uh, tillage analyses, we selected a subset of these sites that had uh, direct comparisons. So that means only tillage was being changed between the treatments at these sites. So there are 19 in all. Uh, they're shown on the right side of the screen is the sites that are marked with uh, the white stars. And so what we did to uh, compare these different treatments is we categorized them into minimum, moderate, and intense categories. So your minimum category is going to be your no-till systems, where really your only disturbance is going to be planting. Your moderate uh, category is going to encompass all of the different reduced tillage uh, treatments. So things like strip tillage. And then finally, your intense category, these are gonna be your most disruptive treatments. So things like moldboard plow, chisel plows, uh, incorporated with sweet plows, things like that. Um, so we categorize these things because we wanted to look for two different things. First, we wanted to see where we were finding differences in these structures between treatments. And then secondly, who are these organisms that are causing these changes in these treatments? So we utilize, <clears throat> excuse me, two different me uh, measurements uh, out of the SLU that we uh, analyzed for the project. The first being 24-hour uh, carbon mineralization. And so these, this test was performed on air-dried two millimeter sieve soil. Uh, and you'll see a picture on the right of the apparatus that's used to measure uh, this mineralization. So what's going on in the picture is these soils, they had already been um, dried and sieved, and then they're re-wetted and placed in these ball jars. And you'll notice these tubes that are coming out of the jars, uh, they're collecting the uh, carbon dioxide that's emitted from those microbes performing their different activities. So that's our measurement of activity. And then we have our measurement of uh, microbial community structure. And so for this study, we used uh, 16S rRNA amplicon sequencing. And so it's a measure of your bacterial and archaeal community structure. Um, and so we analyzed uh, the amplicon sequencing on eight millimeter fresh sieve soil. So a little bit different than the mineralization process. So to get into some of the results, first we wanted to look at uh, the you know, most extreme uh, instances of differences in tillage. So we looked at these differences between our minimum uh, in, uh, disturbance treatments and intense treatments. And so what we found was 11 of the 14 sites that we looked at with these comparisons had significant differences in that community structure due to tillage. And it was interesting to note that uh, the three studies that didn't have significant differences in structure, they were all wheat-based rotations. And so at these three sites, they did come from different climates and different soil properties. So what we're kind of thinking is that potentially the greater biomass uh, incorporated into the soil from those uh, wheat-based systems kind of mimics uh, the residue incorporation from tillage. So that might be why we're not seeing those significant differences. Then on the right side of the screen, uh, so this is a detrended correspondence analysis figure. And what it's doing is it uh, condenses these complex interactions between these different uh, microbiome samples into uh, a, a two-axis two system. So, uh, the first axis, your x-axis, it, what it's showing is it's explaining about 45% of the variation in the microbial community structure. And then your second axis, your y-axis, is explaining about another 29% of that variation. So what you'll notice that probably jumps out first to you is uh, the samples, they're all kind of grouped by colors, similar colors. And so what that's denoting is that the biggest driver in community structure is uh, we're seeing these differences in, uh, due to sites, due to differences in climates and differences in inherent soil properties. But within these clusters of similar colors, within these individual sites, what we see is we see breakouts of our two different symbols. Uh, so our symbols, the circles, they represent samples from our intense tillage treatments. 
while our uh, triangles represent samples from those uh, minimally disturbed treatments. So what we're seeing is even though they're spread uh, throughout the sites, we're seeing within sites uh, that there's differences due to these structures. So the next thing we want to see now that you know we know that there is there's some overlap between these sites, but you know a lot of differences too. We wanted to see if there is a set of microbes that were enriched similarly across all of those 11 sites that had significant differences. And it turns out there are. So we found that there are 717 different microbes that were enriched under minimum tillage. And so what this means is there are significantly more of these microbes in these sites in the minimum tillage when compared to your intense tillage. So on average, they represented about 33% of your bacterial and archaeal population in your minimum tillage uh, treatments, whereas they only represented about 16 in your intense tillage treatments. And so the figure here kind of shows that breakout. So on the x-axis, uh, we have uh, our different samples categorized as uh, minimum or intense tillage treatments. And then they're further split out by those different 11 sites that had significant uh, differences from the treatments. And so what you'll see is these organisms, they aren't contained in the same amounts from all these sites, but they are significantly greater uh, in those across all of those minimum tillage treatments. Uh, and you'll notice too, the bars are colored. Um, so the coloring is by uh, phylum. So this is a very general categorization of your bacteria and archaea. And the one thing that I just wanna point out with this is that it's not just one type of microbe that's being enriched under uh, minimum tillage when you convert to minimum tillage, but a whole slew of uh, different players that are active in that change uh, when you reduce your tillage. So we did also look at comparisons between our uh, less intense tillage treatments or tillage comparisons. So we looked at uh, differences between minimum and moderate site comparisons. And so only four out of seven of those sites contain significantly different community structures. And we saw kind of similar results when we looked at moderate to intense site comparisons. Uh, only four out of the eight uh, sites that we had with those comparisons had con significantly different community structures due to tillage. So less clear than you know, our, uh, our more uh, stretched out tillage comparison between the minimum and intense. But what we found was when we grouped those different comparisons by pH, we found that uh, the comparisons from sites that had pHs from between, ranging from between 5.7 to 6.5, they didn't have different uh, microbial community structures. But the microbes uh, from sites uh, from outside of that range, they had different community structures due to tillage. So there may be something going on as far as, you know, that, that key of resilience uh, in those slightly acidic soils. So instead of getting into the nitty gritty of the uh, mineralization modeling results, I'd like to spend my last few minutes uh, describing a few different groups of organisms uh, that were enriched under minimum tillage and also highly important in predicting those mineralization measurements. So the first is Acidobacteria subdivision six. So this is a group of bacteria that's present in a wide range of soils. Uh, we know that it's slow growing, adaptive to low nutrient concentrations, and it produces these uncharacterized uh, extracellular polymeric substances or in essence, kind of like, uh, you can think of them as a biofilm. So when we go back to thinking about those drivers of, uh, you know, what's happening with those mineralization measurements that these biofilms might uh, allow this group of organisms to better prosper through that drying period and then uh, excel once that soil is rewetted. So in another organism uh, that we know less about, uh, but some so far, is uh, the species Candidatus udeobacter. So this species is contained in the Varimicobria phylum. Um, and it's what's interesting about this phylum is they're highly prevalent in, uh, in uh, native prairie systems in the Midwest. And you'll notice here, uh, I don't have a picture of this bacteria. And the reason for that is it's never been successfully cultured in the lab. So what we know about this organism is from uh, reconstruction of its genome uh, from metagenomic samples. And so what scientists have been able to find is it contains enriched quantities of these protease and amino acid transporter genes. 
So what that means is it's able to obtain these different metabolites from the soil environment. So when we go back to thinking about those mineralization measurements, you know, we have these different other organisms that exude these metabolites upon that rewetting. And this might be a player of someone that, you know, can readily uh, obtain those and cause those increases in that measurement. So overall, what we found was that tillage intensities, they do create measurable differences in microbial communities at the continental scale. Uh, we found wheat biomass, it may mimic tillage residue incorporation, but overall outside of those wheat systems, we did find that uh, certain microbes were enriched across these different climates and soils. And then secondly, we found that when we're looking at smaller differences in disturbance, the soil mattered a bit more. So, you know, we found that there's no difference in community structure in those slightly acidic soils. So the slightly acidic soil communities may be more resilient to those physical disturbances uh, than ones outside of that range. And then finally, uh, we found that, you know, bacteria and archaea in these no-till systems, they adapt to prosper under conditions where there's finite nutrient resources. And these mechanisms that they use to prosper under these conditions may lead to these increases that we see in these carbon mineralization measurements. And so with that, I would like to thank our partners and funders, uh, specifically the Samuel Roberts Nibble Foundation, General Mills, and the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. And I can't forget to thank all of our different partnering scientists from those 124 long-term sites. This whole project wouldn't have been possible without all of them. So with that, I think we might have time for a question or two. Thank you, Liz. So one, one of the questions, I, I see a couple of questions on the same route. So uh, you, you sample 15 centimeters of soil and so how, how would the depth of soil influence your uh, results? Sure, yeah, I think that you would definitely see different results if you measured uh, deeper into the soil profile. Uh, so we measured the top 15 centimeters is it's, um, similar to what uh, most soil health tests in the past have done. And that's because it's, we're looking at that active rooting zone. Um, and so there's microorganisms that are active, you know, in this, this plant interactions. Um, so that's why we chose that. But yes, I would expect to see, I don't know, maybe similar results uh, deeper down. It would depend, I guess, how far down you're tilling into your soil. Thank you. Uh, the, another question is uh, how, how do you think, uh, higher tillage intensity in an organic production, um, what would be the results that you would expect versus, you know, uh, not an organic production system? Sure, yeah, I mean, there's been studies out there that have shown that, you know, organic additions are capable of changing the soil microbiome themselves. So we may see a, a bigger change uh, due to tillage with the incorporation of those organic materials that are may be more readily available for microbial consumption than say plant residues that may be a bit tougher to break down. Okay, uh, lots of questions. Oh boy. <laughs> so uh, there's a question saying, uh, are you measuring populations after the carbon uh, uh, incubations? Uh, if not, maybe the species common before the incubation are the ones being eaten? Yeah, so-, so timing. Yeah, timing, no. And so these were all samples that were collected at the same time. Um, I would really like to set up an experiment though to see how much that changes, how much the microbial community might change after that 24 hours of that incubation. And I believe what we might see is that the magnitude of change will probably be dependent on uh, where the soil came from, right? You know, so a soil from uh, you know, a dry, uh, hot area probably won't have the same response or, you know, might not lyse as many cells as say a soil from, you know, a wet cool area that doesn't experience, you know, that drying um, much of the time. Okay, uh, another question is uh, focusing on, uh, uh, did you collect bulk soil samples or did you focus on rhizosphere, you know, and do you think it would be different uh, as, uh, as regards to, you know, the community structure? Sure. Yeah. No, and these were, they were bulk soil samples. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So we collected um, composite samples from the treatments uh, and uh, yeah, and then took, you know, a small aliquot from that. 
But I do believe that it would be different if looking at the rise of sere soils. But one thing that we have been starting to see is the bulk soils do influence the rise of sere soils. So maybe a fun new study down the line. Okay, thank you. And I think we are on time. So uh, right. thank you very much, Wayne, for this opportunity and to all the speakers. And uh, the floor is yours.